the end of an era. After millennia, Phyrexia finally lies defeated. A force so powerful that it made even Uzza to bound down to it was eventually humbled and broken. There is always a greater power, Bolas once said and he was right, for there is no greater power than lazy writing and its closest allies, plot armor, divine intervention and of course the power of friendship. In the following minutes I'll examine the most egregious offenders, combined with examples with the most recent stories. Also, spoilers ahead. Chapter 1 The Hive Mind Oil I've read multiple comments of people trying to explain away the shutting down of all Phyrexians with the Hive Mind Oil, previously known as Glistening Oil, which was supposedly enhanced to have such qualities. The story also makes such illusions. Suppose you're in Phyrexia, you're going to complete thousands of people in short order. What's the best way to keep in contact with them? Sahili had asked them. Some kind of signal, answered Kaya. A call only they can hear, Sahili nodded. Just so, but what we will use to carry your signal? What unifies all Phyrexians? Oil? ventured Chandra. That's right. Maybe that's why they're so intent on spreading it, to amplify whatever signal they were spreading in the first place. Now that Phyrexia has left the multiverse, they've gone out of range. The oil keeps listening for new orders, but it isn't receiving any. Why is that? Well, there are a host of possible answers, all of your study. However, in my expert opinion, I think all of it was tied back to Elish Norn. A megalomaniac of that scale wouldn't want anyone else to have control over her army. I imagine she was the only one who could send orders, and further, that the oil is rendered inert without her. Wouldn't want a rival seizing control when you've lost contact, would you? So without her... The wiki page for Jingitaxias, however, disproves this by stating that the only enhancements he ever made were to make it more resistant to Melira's immunity granting abilities, and more potent to being able to take over flesh faster than ever before. Considering each Praetor is looking out for himself and his personal vision of Phyrexia, it is doubtful that Jin could install such a hive mind property and not keep it for himself. It is even more doubtful that he would simply give it to Norn and effectively relinquish control of himself over to her. I mean, we saw how he attacked her right before the end. Second, it is a major design flaw, literally putting all eggs in one basket. Remember how the Wanderer slashed him in two in that one set that shall not be named? Imagine if he was the hive mind. No one would retrieve his body, and everything would end right then and there. Furthermore, it is a massive nerf to the power of the all itself, whose main strength is that whatever happens to Phyrexia, even a single drop can recreate it as it happened on Mirrodin, when Khan inadvertently transported some. The story itself never references a hive mind directly, but regardless the results speak for themselves, as we see in March of the Machine 10. Soldiers scramble like piles of twigs, their metal limbs falling off the platform. Hope blooms in Pia's breast. All the Girapu is the same, the Phyrexians are falling. Some stop in place, some crumble apart, those already completed fall to the ground as if in deep slumber. In the distance, their warship is plummeting from the sky. Thus we will start off from this point. The oil is a hive mind network that transmits orders, either from the mouth of machines or new Phyrexia to the Phyrexians. Apart from the end result of the Phyrexians shutting down, we see nothing of that in the story, and the only two examples I could find that ever remotely suggest such a thing can be explained by our means. In Domino United 5, Shieldred says, I've acquired the targets, I'm ready to return. And then the planner bridge activates and transports her, Khan and Ajani to New Phyrexia. One can argue that this is her using the hive mind to relay this message to some Phyrexian on the other end, who in turn tell Tezzeret to open the bridge. This however is not how a hive mind should work. You don't need to spell things out verbally, as Sheldred did in this story, but simply think them, and because the minds are connected, 
and act as a single organism, the receiver of the thought should know it immediately. Alternatively, since Shieldwit is the one giving the order, does that mean she is in control of the hive mind oil? If so, why didn't shut down everyone with her death? The other example is in the same story, where Shieldwit says, I have the Manaric, I have you. Dominaria is vulnerable to invasion. All the wonders of my people will become your wonders. All our beauty will become your beauty. There is only one truth. The next step in evolution will be completed. All around the battlefield, Phyrexian murmured, There, there is, is only one truth. The murmur rose from the ranks, softer than a wind, from distorted mouths, and far more eerie. This repetition of the same phrase, however, also does not imply the existence of a hive mind, especially when this phrase has obvious religious meaning. On the other hand, we have numerous examples that disprove the existence of such Phyrexian hive mind. One of the major properties of a hive mind in fantasy is that it is so domineering that it can easily override the individual's personality, thoughts, emotions, even basic instincts, to the point where the singular is indistinguishable from the whole. But in the case of the completed planeswalkers, we see major discrepancies. Ajani, for example, doesn't hesitate for a second to kill his friend Jaya, as we see in Dominar United 5. Jaya clutched the Silex protectively to her chest. Still stunned, she took one step back, retreating toward the workshop. Fire flared around her, encircling her. This motion seemed to trigger Ajani. He swept up his axe and drove it into her body. Jaya's back arced, and her mouth gaped in pain. She fell. Shieldwit calculated your strength well. The mechanical voice emanating from Ajani's throat sounded nothing like his usual growl. The Silex and Khan, two of the artifacts the Whispering One wished to obtain in Dominaria. You would have to kill me, Jaya gasped, before I'd let you. Yes, Ajani said simply, hoisting her from the air with one hand. You are dying. On the other hand, Tamiyo hesitates when she is ordered to complete her homeworld Kamigawa, as we see in March of the Machine 1. Furthermore, in March of the Machine 3, she doesn't want to hurt her friends or her son, and asks the Wanderer for a mercy kill. Were you watching closely? Before I struck Tamiyo mouth something. I saw that, but she could have been doing anything. I thought she was preparing a curse. She wasn't. The Wanderer says, All the shards she threw at me went too wide to do any damage. Didn't you notice? She sets a hand on one of Kyodai's many masks, and the Kami touches her in turn. A hard won moment of tenderness on a battlefield like this. Tamio was making a request in the only way she could. This is not a behavior of someone connected or dominated by a hive mind. Next comes the constant infighting between the Praetors. One has to wonder, if Elish Non controls the hive mind, how is there infighting at all? How is it possible for Urabras to plot a rebellion and they would instruct the rebels on how to get to the Realm Breaker and for the invasion plans? Why is there a need for Non to brand shield with an apostate and execute her? Last but not least, if we are to believe Sarah's ghost, she asserts in March of the Machine 6 that This threat, and it is not carried by none alone. She believes herself to be the beginning and end of Phyrexia, but she is wrong. Killing her will not end this. Then let us look into the other option. The oil itself is the hive mind, and it gives orders and commands to the Phyrexians. One must ask how and why do they retain their personality. Why some like Tamio make a very conscious resistance to the Earl's core tenets to spread the glory of Phyrexia? If they can maintain such a level of autonomy, why would they shut down when new Phyrexia phased out? Additionally, Sahili's argument is that since new Phyrexia phased out and the Phyrexian can't get a signal and shut down. On the surface this sounds plausible, 
but there is a wrinkle. It was actually Khan who bought the oil to New Phyrexia, formerly known as Mirrodin, but it came originally from Old Phyrexia. This means two things. Since New Phyrexia isn't the source, then phasing it means nothing, and should do nothing to the oil and the Phyrexians on other planes. Since the oil was active till March of the Machine 10, it also confirms that all Phyrexia still hasn't disintegrated, and since it was the original source, the Phyrexian should have never ceased to function. Unless you mean to tell me that old Phyrexia disintegrated at the same time as new Phyrexia phased out, which should be even worse writing, and frankly some next level nonsense. Finally, I'd like to point out one final and frankly quite mind-boggling inconsistency. In March of the Machine 1, Eleshnon orders Atraxa to go to New Capenna and teach these people the price of their insolence. They could have joined our ranks once, but they will no longer find any such mercy from us. You will harvest them all. Yet in March of the Machine 6, we see Sarah's goal showing Elspeth visions of what is happening and making her choose where she would um, reconstitute her new agenic body in order for her to become the deus ex machina she was apparently always meant to be. In those visions, we see New Capenna as Atraxa is attacking the plane, and we get this sentence. A batwing creature that might once have been a maestro descends on a fleeing man. So, are we to understand? The non's most faithful servant disobeyed her orders and started completing the citizens of New Capenna. Of course not, because just a few sentences down, in the same story, we hear Sarah again repeating Nord's orders, which are conflicting with what we just read. The invader has been given strict orders. There were to be no survivors on New Capenna. Only our organs and bones will live on. I'd somewhat understand some level of inconsistency between different chapters, as they probably aren't written on the same day, but how do you write one thing and contradict it two sentences later? I know writing is hard, but come on. Chapter 2 The Ease The second thing that bothered me was how anticlimactic and downright easy everything was in the entire story. People say a story is only as good as its villain, but how that villain is defeated also matters. The greatest champions, the heralds of the new age, the completed plateswalkers, are for the most part easily defeated. Tamio commits Sudoku at the hands of the Wanderer. Ajani comes to the final battle already weakened and is easily netted and dragged away like a stray kitten. Nisa is casually bonked on the head by Deus Ex Machina Elspeth and loses consciousness, like a normal human, instead of a killing machine of flesh and metal. Heliot, one of the strongest gods of Terrors, and as a bonus now fully completed, literally doesn't see his end coming, when Kaya casually climbs on his body and kills him with her dagger. Kratos better take notes. Atraxa, the most loyal and powerful of Arexian after the Praetors, simply walks into a falling building and that's it. I don't know about reprints, but that pathetic death is sure to bring down her price. And the Praetors, oh, the Praetors. Elish Norn is basically a Disney villain, screaming, protect me minions, why aren't you protecting me? On top of that, her final end comes from none other but Khan, his I'll do a genocide with the Silex for the greater good storyline was already bad character-wise, so let's put a bow on it. Cause you know, why kill one character when you could kill two, am I right? Jingitaxius and his offspring is supposedly killed while he's too busy to pick at Non's mangled body. Shield is on ceremonies with decapitated, and Urabrask is dismembered and supposedly killed off-screen, mind you although this remains somewhat open. Vorinclex is probably the worst death. He is an apex predator, entirely designed for hunt and combat, yet he is easily dispatched with the cartoonish look behind you and a sucker punch from Elspeth. All this in four short sentences. 
this has to be the very definition of low effort. In fact, I approve it. Here I go. Maintaining the spell for so long had taken its toll on Teferi, and his concentration faltered. Sensing this, the Praetor pushed and broke free from the hold, his sharp talons slashing through the planeswalker's mount. The death throes of the beast threw Teferi off the saddle, a heavy foot announcing his fall. Vorinclex approached him slowly, like a lion approaching a wounded prey, savoring the taste of its fear. Yet, in his final moments, Teferi wasn't afraid, for he lived just long enough to see the return of his homeland. The Praetor raised his arm and swung. Teferi didn't flinch. He was going to stay defiant to the very end. But the end never came, as Vorinclex's claw stopped mere inches from his face. The Praetor froze for a second, gazing in his eyes. In them he saw a distant light that expanded rapidly, growing, blazing, approaching. The Praetor turned with unnatural speed and raised his hand to block the incoming attack. It was a futile effort, for the Archangel's sword cut through bone and sinew, steel and strings, as if it was nothing. The blade then continued its downward path, splitting the Praetor's head in two. Vorinclex's body tensed and then relaxed, crumbling on the ground into a foul heap. Tiferi looked at Elspeth and silently nodded in gratitude. As the archangel flew away, he found his staff and got up on his feet. All around him the battle still raged. He would rest later. As you can see, my version pretty much follows the same main event structure. For reference, it took me around 15 minutes to write this, including one rewrite. I do have some writing experience, but I'm by no means a professional writer. By the way, I'm always open to feedback, so I'd appreciate if you tell me what you think of my version, and whether you prefer it, or the original one we got in the stories. Now let's get back to the story. The much dreaded and hyped invasion frankly couldn't even take off. I think it failed to conquer even a single world. Moreover, the Uno reverse card counter invasion was simply hilarious, and the relative ease with which Zalfi was brought back was also quite anticlimactic. I won't even comment on the fact that the Phyrexians abandoned their tried and tested approach of infiltrating a world, slowly corrupting it from within and creating divisions till it was ripe for conquering and instead decided to invade the entire multiverse, all at once, thus presenting the combined populace of the multiverse to conveniently unite against them. I won't say a single word about that. The only characters that died were Tamio and Melira, and those were, dare I say, very unnecessary deaths, considering how completed planeswalkers can be cured, but apparently an abdomen wound is fatal, so long as your plot armor fails you. Ren had a funeral with a very heavy Groot from the Guardians of the Galaxy illusions that she will be reincarnated from that acorn that Teferi planted, so I'm not counting her as dead yet. Ajani and especially Nisa were cured with the power of friendship and the last of Venser's spark. I know examples of sparks to be completely used up for various rituals, such as those of Rada or Leshrak, but I didn't know they can be rationed for later use. The more you know. In the end it's all good in the hood. Everyone cheered and laughed, especially the Ewoks. The end.